The Gemini spacecraft, originally codenamed Mercury 2, was a two-person ship designed to test several key lunar mission activities, namely rendezvous and docking. Though about the size of a Volkswagen, crews spent up to two weeks in low Earth orbit in Gemini capsules, conducting long-duration missions as the United States geared up for the moon. The hopes of lunar missions were set upon the shoulders of the Apollo Command Service Module and Lunar Excursion Module. However, some believed the work and cost of Apollo was not necessary. Using Gemini, the U.S. could beat the Soviets to the moon and do so up to three years before President Kennedy's objective of landing on the moon by the end of the decade. In 1965, after the Gemini program launched its first manned mission, Gemini 3, astronaut Pete Conrad conspired with manufacturers Martin and McDonnell to advocate an early circumlunar flight using a Gemini spacecraft. A declassified memorandum documents a June 24, 1965 meeting at the Manned Space Flight Center between the contractor's corporate heads and the highest NASA management, where the companies provided a detailed proposal to launch a refurbished, modified Gemini around the moon by April 1967 for a mere $350 million. A secret decision was made in a closed-door meeting of Congress where Conrad testified to the Gemini Moon program and NASA head James Webb argued for the continued full funding of Apollo. General Curtis LeMay, Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, argued for increased Air Force funding and to allow the Air Force to take over the Gemini after NASA completed its program's main objectives. Congress agreed to apportion $500 million to the Air Force on the condition that the Gemini Moon program would remain a secret classified Air Force special project. Before NASA completed the public Gemini program, the Air Force was conducting test launches in preparation for taking over, including an unmanned circumlunar test flight, Gemini L-1, in 1965. In 1966, the Air Force took over the Gemini project and conducted a circumlunar flight, Gemini L-2, in June. That mission went as follows. A Titan III-C would launch a Centaur upper stage equipped with an Agena-type docking collar into low Earth orbit. Two minutes into the flight, the side boosters burnt out and were ejected. Soon thereafter, the fairings, exposing the centaur to the vacuum of space. The third stage of the Titan III would put the centaur into orbit. A Titan II would launch the Gemini capsule, just as it had for public missions. After the first stage burnt out, the second stage would continue to push the Gemini capsule into orbit. After completing the orbit, the Gemini disconnected from the second stage of the Titan II.
Then, the Gemini capsule would meet up with the Centaur already in orbit. The pilot of the Gemini capsule would slowly inch towards the Centaur and eventually dock. They're now ready for the moon. After performing a quick Uliage burn, the two Centaur engines would light and propel the Gemini to translunar speeds. At the allotted time, the engines would stop their burn and Gemini would coast the rest of the way to the moon. While on the way to the moon, the Gemini would perform a barbecue roll, slowly rolling the spacecraft, allowing the sun to evenly heat the spacecraft. Jim and I would continue this barbecue roll all the way to the moon. And at the moon, they would stop the barbecue roll and disconnect from the centaur. The Gemini craft would then turn around and circularize the orbit. Once in orbit, crews would enjoy the beautiful views of the lunar surface. And after just a few orbits, would relight their engines and burn back for the Earth. Starting another barbecue roll, the crew would prepare to return back to the Earth.
Before entering the Earth's atmosphere, the Gemini capsule would detach its propulsion and guidance systems. The crew experienced significant G-forces on re-entry, and plasma built up around the heat shield prevented communication with Air Force controllers. Before releasing its parachutes, the nose cone of the Gemini was jettisoned and a drogue chute was released. The drogue chute would disconnect and the main parachute would come out. Slowing the craft to a nice gentle descent, the parachute allowed the Gemini capsule to hit the water at a mere few meters per second. After the success of Gemini L2, the Air Force launched Gemini L3 for the first landing on the moon in 1967. On this flight, the Titan 3C would launch the Centaur into LEO and the Gemini capsule with a single seat bare bones three to four thousand pound lander attached to the bottom was boosted by an upgraded Titan II. The crew rendezvoused and docked just as Gemini L2 had done, and the Centaur boosted them to the moon. Once at the moon, the crew used the onboard thrusters to get into lunar orbit. One crew member would perform an EVA to the lander, undock, and proceed down to the surface for landing.
After a successful landing and a short moonwalk, the astronaut climbed back into the lander and ignited the engine once again and performed a single burn to rendezvous orbit. The lander and Gemini capsule made a close approach, and the astronaut EVA'd from the lander to the Gemini capsule. Afterwards, the onboard thrusters performed the trans-Earth injection and brought the crew back home. This program, although secret, ensured the United States both beat the Soviet Union to the moon and did so by the end of the decade and at a fraction of the cost of Apollo. Because of the success of the Apollo, the Gemini program would remain secret and never be revealed.